Shane Beamer used one of the oldest media tricks in the book on Tuesday afternoon, one that has worked for him several times before. But the question is, is it going to work for him this time around? You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks Podcast. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast, and you can find my written work over on Gamecocks Digest on SI.com. I thank y'all so much, as always, for making the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast your first listener watch for your team every day. We are free and available both on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. Shane Beamer is a head coach that has multiple positive traits and those positive traits have led to a lot of belief from South Carolina's fan base obviously one of them is related to the fact that he has coached at South Carolina in the past he is somebody that knows this program like the back of his hand he's a really good people person he is somebody that seems to be able to relate to modern athletes much better than say some of his counterparts in his profession And one of his best traits as a coach is his ability and willingness to publicly reinforce his belief in his players, which he did on Tuesday. But I don't think that's going to be enough to alleviate the issues that South Carolina has with its offensive line unit right now. To really dive into this conversation, here's a clip and soundbite of what Shane Beamer had to say about his offensive line and also some of the critics of the Gamecocks offensive line after what happened last Saturday. Yeah, my faith in the offensive line is high. I thought they were really good today. You know, we face a good defense each day in practice, we feel like, and they're throwing a lot at us. And and I thought the whole team came out there with a good – uh, temperament about themselves and, and eagerness to get back out on the field. And, and nobody feels good about Saturday night as well. Confidence in them is, is, uh, is high. We've got good players. I've seen that. Uh, this is not me seeking comfort, but the truth is we, Jalen Nichols was going to be a starting offensive tackle for us. Case and Henry started the game the other night. Both those guys are out right now. We lost three starters off last year's offensive line. So we've got a lot of new faces and it's five guys that have to come together and gel. And it just doesn't happen like that, particularly when you have injuries like we've had with Marquee and, and uh, Jacob Moore was kind of banged up throughout the summer. So he was limited in what he was able to do early on. So those guys will be fine. I got total confidence in them, total confidence in our offensive line, coaching everything. So I know everybody right now, they're the easy targets to get you know to criticize the offense line well get your shots in now is what i would tell people and then when they start playing their ass off as this year goes throughout the season make sure you're giving them credit too as the year goes on also now there's two different parts of this clip and soundbite that i want to address let's start off with the latter portion of that soundbite where shane beamer clearly stuck up for the offensive line and conveyed belief that this is a unit that is going to get better as the 2023 season continues to progress. Now, this is, again, one of the oldest tricks in the book that a head football coach can utilize. Some call it driving the Roy bus, which stands for the rest of y'all. So basically, the rest of y'all can think what you want, but we all know we got in this room. Or you may call it circling the wagons. The thing about this trick is that Some coaches try to use that, but because they aren't always maybe real and genuine with the players behind closed doors, it does not feel completely sincere to the players. But that is not the case with Shane Beamer. So he's a coach that has used this a couple times in the past. The most recent example that I can think of is when Dow Loggins got hired this past December, in which he went to the podium and basically... Um, in a way, excoriate the people that deemed the hire to be a terrible one, and Dow Loggins had not even coached a single snap of football here in Columbia, referencing his resume, some of the coaches that talked about him and spoke glowingly about him, and also the fact that South Carolina, it wasn't like they stepped out on an island somewhere when they were pursuing Dow Loggins, because he had had 
conversations with other coaches, including coaches in the SEC. He is very good at this. And this can pay off in multiple ways because it builds trust between himself and the players and coaching staff. And it also sends a great message to recruits that might be looking to come to South Carolina that if you come to Columbia, you're going to have a head coach here that is going to, no matter the circumstances, always have your back. That's something that people really and truly appreciate, whether it is a boss or in this case, the head coach of a major athletic program. But when you listen to Shane Beamer's entire answer here, you can also very much conclude at the same time that this call to action, this backing of his offensive line publicly, it might not work this time around like it has for Shane in previous situations. Shane talked about the injuries that this offensive line is dealing with or has dealt with, with Jalen Nichols missing the majority of this season because of that knee injury he suffered back in the spring game. Kaysen Henry having to rehab for the majority of the summer leading into fall camp. And now he's back on the mend once again. Ja'Kai Moore apparently missing some time in the summer. Marky Anderson now dealing with a little bit of an injury issue. He talked about losing three starters from last year's team. And he also said we have a bunch of new faces that have to gel. So... It might have sounded like excuses, but the thing is, a lot of that is indeed true. Shane's not making up any of this. But I will say that the part about this unit needing time to gel, or having a bunch of new faces that still need to gel, I don't think that's entirely true. Because here is also some truth here. Vershawn Lee, Tyshawn Wanamaker, and Trey Jones have all been here for several years now. These guys aren't true freshmen. These guys didn't just arrive over the summer. These guys have been here for several years now, including some of the time, I think, before Shane Beamer arrived here and became the head coach. Nick Arjula and Sidney Fugar, two transfers, sure, they're new faces. They got here in January. They went through spring practice. They went through the player run practices over the summertime. It's not like those guys just got off the bus two weeks ago and started practicing with the team here. And these three starters being gone, talking about Eric Douglas, Javon Gwynn, and also Dylan Wonham. Y'all have known that since last December, January, heck, before last season began, that those guys were more than likely all going to be gone after this past season concluded. So again, everything he mentioned is true. I'm not taking anything away in that regard, but it does also come off as Shane Beamer saying that This unit is going to continue to struggle and him going ahead and preemptively listing the reasons for why they are going to struggle. Sure, with time, you'll expect this unit to get better, especially as some of these guys maybe aren't as dinged up. They get a couple of these guys back off the injury list and they play more games together. But the issue is the fact that this unit almost looked like they hadn't even practiced much together at all when they played North Carolina. Fundamental mistakes being made several times in that contest. That's the concerning part. And the thing is, fans aren't going to want to hear this. They're not. So when people do say that this team can still win eight or more games, I don't believe that because of stuff like this. Shane Beamer, he's never one to wave the white flag or be negative when it could be easy to do so. And that's one of his best traits as a head coach. It's one of the reasons why probably his players love him in that locker room. And that's the most important thing for him is to make sure that he has the backing of his guys on this team. But we shouldn't let this attempt to rally the troops blind us when it comes to the legitimate issues that this offensive line unit does have. I'm not trying to pile on. And I don't think anybody out there is trying to pile on. But at the same time... We can't just keep sitting here and acting like, you know, well, everything's just going to automatically get better as the season progresses. Uh, After the North Carolina game, I don't know if we can say that for certain. So, very, very interesting, but it does not surprise me at all that Shane Bieber employed this strategy on Tuesday. Again, that's him trying to get his guys to rally, and that's him trying to get the confidence of those guys back up after what happened this past Saturday. Every good coach would do something like that, whether it's behind closed doors or talking to the media. Shane Beamer's great at that. 
But is it going to work this time around? We'll have to see as the 2023 season continues to move on. Now, it wasn't just pass protection that was an issue this past Saturday. The running game also never showed signs of life against North Carolina. And if this offense is going to help out Spencer Rattler, they're going to have to figure out a way to shore up some of the issues in the running game. So what are some ways in which they could do that? We're going to touch on a few different ways in which South Carolina could get this running game kickstarted beginning this week against Furman in just a couple moments right here on Locked On Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Now, just like an offensive line where all five guys have to be on the same page at the same time, every part of your vehicle has to work and fit perfectly. So the next time you need a water pump, maybe you need tires or a new spark plug or any other part and or accessory for your car, head on over to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure that every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit, or you'll get your money back. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on eBay Motors. Dot com. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Welcome back to this Wednesday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day in just 30 minutes. And as always, thank you to each and every one of you everydayers for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your daily watch or listen, both on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. There are several things that South Carolina could do to try and help this running game get going. This was obviously a big issue against North Carolina this past Saturday. As much as we all looked at the nine sacks that the offensive line gave up, this running game was also a real significant problem for the Gamecocks. And one of the ways that you can help out your quarterback, besides obviously keeping him upright when he is throwing the football, is by also offering some actual concerns in the run game for your opponent. So for South Carolina, what are the things that they could do to try and get things going in that area? Well, the first thing that I thought of is they could run more of a gap run power blocking scheme up front. Now, here's the thing. I've talked about gap run blocking scheme before. That's basically assignment blocking where every single blocker has a specific assignment that relates to one specific player on the defense. Zone blocking, there's a little bit more of a gray area because you're moving in space and you sort of have to block your person based on where everybody is in relation to sort of your zone or your area that you're responsible for. That is the simple version of gap run blocking schemes and zone blocking schemes. Gap run blocking schemes are deemed to be a bit easier because, again, you have one main assignment that you're responsible for. And also, you're not always required to have to move quickly in space, horizontally on the field, which is typically what zone blocking entails. For South Carolina's offensive line unit, based on what I saw against North Carolina, I think that the Gamecocks need to scrap a lot of the zone blocking run schemes that they have in this offensive scheme. Every single scheme is going to have power run blocking and also zone run blocking plays. But you got to find a strength in terms of going with one over the other. For the Gamecocks, I think power run blocking plays is going to be the way to go. Now, they have shown a propensity to do that in the past couple of years under Shane Beamer using some counter, using some power, using some duo. So I guess the point is stick with what works best with this offensive line, which in the past has been power run blocking. And with this offensive line unit, I would say that you're going to have to stick with that for at least this season. Now, another way which you could help alleviate the issues in the running game offensively is to get to carry on Joyner or Lenore Sellers some snaps as a wildcat quarterback. 
I'm not going to sit here and completely give up on the idea of DeCaron Joyner being a primary back in this offense. Now, I did say that I felt like he did not do the greatest of jobs in terms of shedding blocks, or excuse me, shedding tacklers, whenever he was actually in open space. Granted, he also did not give me opportunities to get some one-on-one chances in the open field because of the lackluster run blocking in front of him. So, put to Carol Joyner back there behind the center in the shotgun, give him some wildcat snaps. We saw what he could do when he's in that position last year when the Gamecocks played against Tennessee. Tennessee could not stop it. South Carolina ran it several times. You could do a bevy of different things out of that formation, run a bevy of different plays. DeCaron Joyner is a legitimate athlete that can also throw the football deep down the field. Create a whole formation that includes a bunch of plays. You could do that within like a day or two, in all honesty. And if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to pull him from running back and say, now make him a Wildcat quarterback again, well then fine. Put Lenore Sellers in the football game more. Again, Luke Doty offers a lot to this team. He clearly is willing to do anything to help this team win football games. And that is quite admirable. But Lenore Sellers, he's just got a couple of things in terms of his athletic profile that Luke Doty just doesn't have. He could shed tacklers at a higher rate. He is bigger. He can make quicker cuts, in my opinion, than Luke Doty can. Luke Doty might have him when it comes to straight line speed. That might be the one area where he has Lenore Sellers. But Sellers hasn't beat everywhere else. Why wouldn't you at least get him some snaps back there and see what he could do in terms of being an extension of your run game? Again, that's not saying that he has to go out there now for half the game and eat up some of Spencer Rattler's snaps in this offense. But he certainly can help. I mean, my gosh, if guys get in the backfield, at least you'd know Lenore Sellers has a chance to get out of there and make something out of nothing, which right now is what you're going to probably have to do with the way this ground game looked in week one against North Carolina. One last thing that I think that Dow Loggins and this offensive coaching staff could do involves RPOs, run pass options, where basically, again, Spencer Rattler has the option to either just hand the ball off, typically on an inside run, or... He can pull it and throw the ball down the field, typically either on a slant route or maybe on some sort of screen or swing pass that's going to the perimeter near the sideline. Now, South Carolina, in the past year or so, have run a lot more RPOs that involve the perimeter, involve the horizontal passing game, involve screens, swing passes, whatever the heck they want to say about it. I think the Gamecocks need to start running more RPOs that involve slants, routes that go over the middle of the field. And here's the thing. Dow Loggins comes from Arkansas, a place where they had Kendall Bryles as their offensive coordinator for the past three years. Kendall Bryles incorporated a lot of RPOs in his offensive scheme. Dow Loggins got to witness a lot of those play calls and the thought process behind those play calls from Kendall Bryles. I would take some of those RPOs and I would put that into this offense. Maybe there was a couple he called on Saturday night against North Carolina that I just don't recall off the top of my head, but I don't believe there was any that involved a potential slant route going behind the second level defenders. That would be a very quick way to get some of these linebackers, maybe get some DBs that creep up in the box to back off when they know that there's a legitimate chance that you could call an RPO slant pattern where you could basically just have Spencer dump the ball off behind a bunch of guys in the box on maybe a third and short, and it could go potentially for six if all things go right. I think that would easily be something that you could quickly put into this offense which, again, would help out Spencer, and you're running slant routes at wide receiver. Obviously, it's nothing too complicated. Nicholas Harper, that could be a route that you could put him on. Big body receiver, and sure, maybe he needs to work on his release a little bit, but he's got the straight line speed, and as long as he gets past his man, then um, he could take it the distance. So, RPOs would definitely be something else that Dow Loggins could consider adding to this offense. Point being... I think this running game, clearly it needs to get a lot better. 
But I do also think there's legitimately some ways in which this offensive staff can squeeze more juice out of that ground attack. And I think that having more gap run power blocking plays, a wildcat package, and more RPOs would be three quick and easy ways to try and get more out of this rushing attack. Now, as much as we have talked about the issues that South Carolina's football team has and how they can try to go about correcting them this week, we haven't discussed their week two opponent very much, the Furman Paladin. So we're going to change that now on today's show. Furman is an experienced football team. Talked about it, I believe, on our Monday show. Furman is a team that is returning 18 starters or 20 starters from last year's team and 38 of the 44 players on their two deep from their 2022 squad also return. This is a very experienced football team. And in multiple ways, it's a team that is reminiscent of what South Carolina wants to be, especially when it comes to their defense and how they play on special teams. Let's start off with their 2022 offensive stats. The Paladins rushed for 212 yards per game in 2022 and also threw the ball for 209 passing yards per game. So right about a 50-50 split in terms of their yardage output on the ground and also through the air. In 13 games this past fall, quarterback Tyler Huff threw for 15 touchdowns and 8 interceptions on 292 attempts. So... Furman did not air the ball out quite that often. And I think we could all see why. Because Tyler Huff, he has a less than 2-1 to touchdown to interception ratio there. So it seems like that he's a bit turnover prone if he has to cut it loose in the passing game. But Tyler Huff, he is a dual threat quarterback. He rushed for 694 net yards in 2022 and scored eight touchdowns on the ground. So for the second week in a row, South Carolina's defense, they cannot rest on their laurels because this quarterback is a guy that can't scramble out of the pocket and make you pay if you do not keep him contained back there. Now, in terms of their rushing attack specifically, Dominic Roberto was their top back in 2022, and he has returned for the 2023 season. Roberto rushed for 1,120 rushing yards in 2022 and also had 11 touchdowns on the ground. So, Furman, this is a team that they might not dominate you through the air, but they've got a very important, but they've got a very potent ground game that incorporates their quarterback to a significant degree. I have not watched the film yet on Furman's offense. I would have to imagine, though, that this might mean that they have a bit of a spread option element to their offense. So, South Carolina's defense, once again, you're going to have to play fundamentally sound football this weekend, or else Furman is going to rack up a lot of yards on the ground against you. Now, let's move on to the Paladins' defense. This is a defense that had eight different defenders record five or more tackles for loss this past fall. So rush defense seems to be their strength, especially when you consider the fact that only five defenders had three or more sacks in 2022. So the Paladins don't have any dominant pass rusher on that side of the ball. And This continues to be backed up by some of the yardage outputs that their opponents had in 2022. The Paladins only gave up 116 rushing yards on average per game while allowing 272 passing yards per game. So, the Paladins, considering the fact that they only gave up around 20 points per game in 2022... They can bend but not break in the passing game. They won't let you score in the red zone very easily, but they also do thrive when it comes to making life a little bit more difficult for your offense, maybe forcing you into more second and long or third and long situations where you got to have a big play in order to extend your drive. At least that's the feeling that I get when I look at these numbers right here. Now, to end this statistical portion of the conversation, let's talk about a couple miscellaneous stats. The Paladins racked up 29 takeaways 
defensively this past fall. That led the entire FCS in that category. And they also led the FCS in blocked kicks. So, you could tell based on those two stats right there. This is a football team that does what South Carolina wants to do on their end. South Carolina wants to be a team that makes offenses pay for mistakes, in essence, create and force turnovers. They also want to make plays happen on special teams, blocking kicks. And they also, on South Carolina's end, they want to be able to run the ball and stop the run, which, unfortunately to this point, is still a work in progress on both ends. Basically, Furman does everything that Shane Beamer wants his Gamecock football program to be about. And honestly, it's a big reason why it is important for Shane Beamer and his staff to win this game. Because I know Gamecock Nation very well. I know a lot of you are very educated about the game of football. I know a lot of you pay attention to who South Carolina is playing. I know you do your own research on your own time. So you may have already seen some of these numbers before I even went over them on today's show. And the thing you might have taken away is the fact that, you know, again, these are two very similar football teams in terms of what they set out to do when they take the field. So if Shane Beaver and this staff, in a worst-case scenario, if they lose this game on Saturday, it won't just be the fact that you lost to an FCS team. It won't just be the fact that you lost to an in-state program. It would also be a really big punch in the gut if you lost to a team that, based on the numbers, embodies everything that you want your program to be about. There'd be a lot of running jokes about that if you were to lose to the Paladins on Saturday night. So, you look at these stats, there's a couple of main takeaways. One, Furman is a very good team. Two, they got a very diverse ground game. And three, they do all the things that South Carolina wants to do on Saturdays. So, to emphasize a point that I made earlier this week, this game's not going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination, and we'll be sure to dive a little bit further into the Paladins and what all they do on both sides of the ball later on this week. But with that being said, that's going to do it for today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, of which I'll thoroughly enjoy today's show, as always. What are your thoughts on what Shane Beamer said about the offensive line, how he tried to back them up in his press conference on Tuesday And do you think that that could help those guys maybe turn things around? What are some ways that you think the ground game could be improved? And what are your initial thoughts on the Furman Paladins as an opponent for this weekend? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section if you watch today's show on YouTube or shoot me a direct message on Twitter at A-Line underscore SC if you listen to today's show on an audio podcast app. Once again, thank y'all so much for tuning in as always. Have a great rest of your Wednesday, and I'll be sure to catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.